Hi, this is Mary Hood again. The topic of today's talk is how to choose and use curriculum materials wisely. Now my PhD actually is in the area of curriculum instruction. And the first thing that I want to mention is that a curriculum is not necessarily something that you buy that's all prepackaged for you, comes in a big box, all right? A curriculum is simply what you teach and to some extent in what order you teach it. In education, they often refer to this as a scope and sequence, all right? If you're interested, most public schools have a scope and sequence somewhere in their materials, and they may or may not be willing to share that with you. But again, if you're becoming a homeschooler, you want to con take control of this yourself and decide for yourself, especially in the elementary years, uh, what scope and sequence you want to use, what curriculum you want to do, what subjects you want to teach, and all that. Of course, within the confines of whatever is required by your state law. Um, it may seem easiest at first to just pick up one curriculum, get everything from one publisher, have it all set out for you, you know, in some cases even somehow be under somebody else's direction and so forth. But trust me, in the long run, that's not the easiest thing to do. What happens too often is when you buy a l something that's all from one spot, and then supposing it just doesn't work, either for all the kids or for you or just for one of your kids, and you wind up possibly wasting a tremendous amount of money. And then, of course, the tendency is to say, well, I spend all this money, I've got to use it. So you just keep on using it, even though you wind up feeling like you're flogging a dead horse you know, and it's just not working. So my biggest recommendation is to you is that you don't need to go buy a whole bunch of stuff all at once. You know, you really don't. There's nothing that says you have to have this entire curriculum all thought out and prepared the first day of school. All right, so you really don't need to. And it would, it would save you a lot of money and quite a bit of frustration, I think, if you would just ease into it a little bit. And if you absolutely feel like you want to have a little bit there prepared for you right at the beginning, you know, stick with one or two subjects or something. With me, it was typically um, math, uh, especially in the elementary years. In the elementary years, seriously, assuming the public library is open again, uh, they are in my area, I hope they will be in yours soon, if not already, um, you can do practically your whole uh, curriculum, if you will, at the public library. You know, lots of good reading books, um, you know, so social studies and science, lots of good, what Charlotte Mason calls living books, you know, at the library you can use for things like that. The one thing that I found that I always had to have something, maybe pre-made, if you will, uh, was math. And, and that may be different from you. for you. Maybe that part will be easy for you and you feel like you have to have something in science or something else. But for me, it was math. But I often found that um, if I just stuck to what I knew the kids needed to learn at that particular level, I could often get, you know, cute little sticker books at a dollars type store um, and just as effectively as some textbook from some curriculum manufacturer. If you are choosing um, math materials for young children, make sure that they're, they're sticking to basics, you know, uh, and not succumbing to whatever fad happens to be popular right now. And of course, at the mo time I'm doing this, it's still the common core in many areas, which is really essentially an educational fad. And so it, what you want to do is stick to something basic and make sure that they either have or you build in plenty of real life or manipulative type experiences. And keep in mind that manipulatives don't have to be pla expensive plastic things either. They can be Cheerios, M&Ms, Popsicle sticks, you know, just something that the kids can actually use to do some of the problems with before they're trying to do them on paper. If you're having trouble with math, I have a, a um, uh, little booklet, one of my little booklet series called Taking the Frustration Out of Math uh, that you might find helpful at some point. Again, right now those things are not available anywhere except through me. Uh, my email is mary.e.hood at gmail.com. If you're interested in that, just let me know. I've got plenty of them here. <laughs> um, all right, so if I was doing my own workshop, I would not even be doing goal uh, curriculum choice yet because I think that you really should be thinking through some of your assumptions about learning first. You should be setting some of your own goals. You should be helping the kids set some goals. You should be getting to know them and their learning styles and everything. And if you could do all that and put off buying some of this curriculum, you do yourself a great favor, all right? If you don't, you're going to wind up wasting some money. I can guarantee you it. The question is how much money? You know, that's why I say if you're going to buy something, limit yourself. Don't run out and buy the most expensive thing and the most complete um, 
complete set of something like that right away. Um, if you are have little children, again, you can use much of the public library for your curriculum, uh, except for me, I always had to do some math. Uh, little kids, they need to be read to, they need to have their character shaped uh, by everyday involvement with you. They need to have some little work experiences around the house. They need to have some active projects, especially young children, and a few minutes once in a while of something more academic and lots of being read to. To me, that's the heart of academics. So you really don't have to have a lot of curriculum material when they're little. By the time they get to high school, typically you're going to feel the need for more curriculum materials. Some things could still be done without them, especially if money is an issue and the public libraries are open. You can do all of literature using good books at the public library. Uh, all you have to do is talk to the librarians. They'd be happy to help you pick out things that would be typically taught in the high schools or things that maybe the high schools aren't teaching but are, that are good quality literature experiences. Um, you can also actually teach things like social studies out of the uh, library. If you just pick something like US history and then start at the beginning and go on through and every time you get to a new uh, time period, you you know go get some new books on it or something. Um, science and math, again, are the hard ones for me, at least uh, to just wing it like that. And so I typically wound up buying a science and a math curriculum, at least one book, you know, for let's say a ninth grader or a tenth grader or something like that. But again, you know, you may find that that stuff comes easy to you and that you need something else, all right? And if you just buy a couple books, you're not going to be wasting gobs of money if it's not working for them. So how do you know what's going to work for your kids? Well, you just have to ask yourself a lot of questions, you know. Uh, you have to begin with asking yourself, is textbooks the approach I want to use? And again, at the high school level, you tend to use more, uh, no matter who you are. But, but textbooks, I, I have a lot of Charlotte Mason influence in me. And, um, and if you're not familiar with Charlotte Mason, I recommend you read the book For the Children's Sake by Susan Schaefer Macaulay. Uh, that's a real good place to start learning about her. But um, uh, textbooks are written by committees. They, uh, they either have an obvious point of view or they try to be completely neutral, which is virtually impossible. Um, they're just not really, they'll, they'll take whole wars and reduce them to a couple of paragraphs. Whereas you, could, you have real living books out there that, um, that, that deal with the subjects much more interesting. For example, World War II, I used to have a video of the man who was the pilot who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima talking for about 15 minutes, you know, and, and that's so much more interesting and, um, and real than having somebody just talk a little bit about uh, the, the war and the end of the war and so forth in some textbook. So I tend to not be much of a textbooky type person, but maybe you are. Again, this isn't about you becoming me. It's about you thinking through what works for you, all right? If you do want textbooks, you have to think about the point of view of the people who are writing them, all right? Um, some of them are very, very overtly Christian. Some are very overtly not. <laughs> and some, a lot of them are kind of halfway in the middle. And uh, you have to decide what approach is going to work for you. Some kids will love workbooks. They just like writing in little books and using stickers and everything else. Some really don't. Some are just outdoor, especially little boys, you know, climbing in the trees, running around type. And, and a lot of those you have to do a lot more projects and, um, you know, things like science, you know, and building birdhouses and doing gardening projects and going to the zoo and all that sort of thing. And for that type of kid, just a little bit of um, maybe sit down and work every day, not a lot, and also re being read to. To me, that's the heart of education, especially in the early years, you know. So uh, you just have to ask yourself, and of course, these answers don't come quickly. It takes time. Obviously, you know your children, but you may not know your children educationally right now. You may not totally understand their learning styles or how their learning style is going to interface with your teaching style and so forth. So that's why I, why I recommend that you don't get a lot fast. All right. Now, the question, of course, is where I'm going to find them. And the answer is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> when I started, it was an issue. We couldn't always find the materials. Now you're going to be swamped. Every friend you have is going to tell you what they're using and tell you to get that. And then there's going to be used book sales with all sorts of tempting things. And then once they open up again, you've got the yearly curriculum fairs where you can be so overwhelmed if you just walk in without having a clue what you're doing. And that's why I say it's so important to think through your own educational ideas. And after a while, you'll start figuring out what works for you and what doesn't, what works for each of your kids. So, so that when I walked into a curriculum fair after the first couple of years, 
I would know immediately to walk past certain booths because they didn't have things that I wanted. And I would also know that one of my boys, if given a little bit of money, which I often gave each of them a little money when I went in there, uh, one of them would head straight for the book and, and just buy lots of books, you know, reading type books, interesting books. Uh, another one would go to the science uh, vendors and buy little science kits to make and so forth. So gradually you'll figure out what works for you, but the first time you go to one of those things, prepare to be totally overwhelmed, all right? and leave most of your money at home. <laughs> uh, I always say, if you pick some vendor's brain a lot and you see something that they have there, please don't say, well, I can get that cheaper on Amazon. Remember, these people are mostly small mom and pop businesses that, that need to survive if we want to have this kind of, uh, of help out there for us. So, so be prepared to, you know, um, to spend money at the uh, at the booths that are really being helpful to you but also be prepared not to spend everything and not to purchase some huge curriculum and to the extent you can have your kids uh, join in in the in the process of, of uh, selecting materials because the more they join in the more likely that they're going to wind up wanting to use it when it's all said and done uh, now so you've got your curriculum all lined up, and now the question is, make sure that you use those curriculum materials and don't let the materials use you. In other words, you can speed up, you can slow down, you can omit entire sections, all right? You can add in things, all right? You can do virtually anything you want to with those, and don't get hung up on the issue of grade level. That's the whole idea of assumptions again. It is, grade level doesn't mean that much in homeschooling. So don't think, well, I have to finish this entire book in the second grade because it's a second grade book. Well, if, it's, if you're needing to slow down, then maybe the next year you start up with there and maybe halfway through the year you'll switch to a third grade. The point is use them. If something's inappropriate, get rid of it, you know, if it's, in other words, if it doesn't fit your, your, uh, your beliefs. And if the whole thing isn't working at all, be prepared to trash it, you know, or more appropriately sell it at some used curriculum sale later on. But the whole idea is not to get locked in, not to spend gobs and gobs of money right away picking all this stuff and then finding it doesn't work for your family and then feeling that because you spent so much money, you have to use it anyway. Huh? And again, it'll all come a lot clearer as you get to know your kids and as you get to think through the assumptions you're carrying around from your days in public school or private school or whatever, um, and setting your own goals and letting those drive you, and then getting to know your children as individuals. I'll be doing workshops in this format uh, talking about assumptions, talking more about goal setting. I mentioned them briefly in another one I did. And also I'll do one on learning styles, all right? But obviously I'm not the only game in town. You can find out about this other places too. Anyway, uh, please share this information with your friends. Uh, subscribe to the Facebook channel, if you will. I mean, to the YouTube, YouTube channel. There's a little red button down there on the bottom. Um, I tend to be uh, a minimalist, so it's just a tiny little red, not a, not a huge thing that's... <laughs> flashing all over your screen, but there is a subscribe button down there. And I'd appreciate it if you subscribe it, not only so you can see these, but so that it will help me to increase the, um, the potential for other people finding it when they search. So the more subscribers, the better. I'm up to about 42 right now. I'm shooting for 100 pretty quickly so that, uh, so that the search engines will pick it up better. And of course, if you're not already in it, uh, please join our Facebook group, also called Relaxed Homeschooling with Mary Hood. And uh, a lot of my books, you can see some of them back there on the shelf, The Relaxed Homeschool, The Joyful Homeschooler, uh, The Enthusiastic Homeschooler, my newest one, um, uh, The Relaxed Homeschooler Rides Again, the one with me on horseback and so forth. A lot of those you can find at the public libraries, that latest one uh, with me on the horse, that's only available right now on Amazon. And one of these days I'll get a, a website back up. But if you can't find something of mine again and you want it, uh, just contact me directly. I certainly have copies of everything here at home that I can send you. And that's it for today. So I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day.